So, I am excited to be here. I have a lot to tell you. I have a little time to do it, but before I do, I just want to give a few thanks uh, to who thanks is due. And I, I would like to start off by saying, I would have to say it's by the grace of God, if you know me, that I'm standing on this stage. Or I would say by it's God's mercies. I love that verse, by the Lord's mercies. It's because of his mercies we are not consumed, you know? Um, so I would like to secondly thank Pastor Tim. Who loves Pastor Tim and his shop, Freedom of Speech? Mm -hmm. I am somebody who likes truth. If you know me, I study the topic. I love to study the philosophy of truth. I love truth. Truth hurts. And one thing I love is open rebuke. I just like it. I'd rather you tell me to my face there's something wrong with me, you know? I had some people come up to me and tell me I was fat, and they, my friends, they tap my stomach. You know what? It made me lose 40 pounds, because every time they'd say to me, hey, B, you know, B, what's going on? You know, I like truth. And Pastor Tim, one day, I was here in Waters Church for maybe like four years sitting in the back row. I know he loves to tell his stories about me, and one of these days I'll give you my testimony, but not today. We'll give you a brief testimony today. I'm sitting in the back, though, and, and I'm um, just learning every week. I'm coming into my sins. I'm dragging my sins with me to church, which is a good thing, by the way. If you're a sinner and you're wrapped in, in bad things, in bondage and sin, you know what? This is the place for you because you'll be set free from it if you listen and apply. So I'm doing this every single week. I'm coming in faithfully. And after like four years, this is when our church was packed, by the way. You couldn't even find a seat. We were growing at a rapid pace. And he just was in one of those moods where it just comes out. And you know what I'm talking about. He just lets you have it. And he, you ready for this? He said on a Wednesday night, he said, if you've just been coming here for a long time and you're just mooching off the gospel, remember those sermons? You're just mooching, listen how you're loved by God and you know, accepted by God and you stay in your sins. Well, he goes, would you do me a favor and would you just leave? And I was like, you know what? Sometimes, guys, when he's preaching, you're like, well, this doesn't apply to me. Maybe it doesn't. It probably applies to the person right next to you, though. And that's what it took for me. That's what it took for me. It took him to literally tell me to get out. I had a friend of mine, and he said he was here in a, one of the same church services, and he goes, I don't go back to your church anymore. And he said the same exact thing, because your pastor told me one day to get out but he didn't listen to the next thing that pastor said. And pastor was teaching some of us that we're lazy and we don't lift a finger for God. And thank God for that day because the next morning I put in my application to serve here. I honestly thought I was gonna clean bathrooms and I was like, Lord, don't let me do that. And I'll tell you something, I came here for a long time and I didn't speak to nobody, I was the I, I came and I sat in the back, and when that service was over, I was the first person out. I would go to the parking lot, and my car was parked in the perimeter, so I would get in my car and gone. And I did this pattern, but because I was full of darkness. What does the Bible say? Men love darkness rather than light, you know? And, and that's who I was. So I put my application in, and um, I'm hoping that they don't make me like vacuum the church. I didn't want to talk to anybody, you know, but they sent me into Red Room and they asked me to be a DJ for the children and to do the lights and the audio. And that's what I have done in the past. And I was like, oh, I like that position. I all of a sudden became super comfortable. I'm working in Red Room and I'm having a blast. I'm wearing red Santa Claus hat, red sunglasses. I'm the best DJ back there. The kids love me. And then one day Cheryl comes up to me and she says, you know, the children love you you should be a teacher here, and my heart dropped. And let me tell you something, I was, I was like, no way, and man, did I fight that mentally. And then I fell in love teaching the children, and I played, and I, I went down to their level, and I made awesome stories. I made the Word of God fun for them. And then Noah's like, the teens would really like you. And I was like, no, man, they have an IQ level. They're gonna judge me, you know? <laughs> and that was a big step. And Little by little, I started to go through the church. And um, so I just wanna thank Cheryl one day for coming up to me and seeing something in me. This is our leadership here. And Pastor Jim from Winsocket, I would follow Jim around. He would show me all the ropes, you know, and my first time I emceed, 
By the way, when I emceed, I had to like write down, good morning, Waters Church. And I mean, I was speaking to you guys off notes. I wasn't even being natural, you know? And Jim would be like, you know, you did good, but your voice was monotone the whole entire time. You did good, but you didn't smile at all. Like, and he would teach me, you know? And um, so there's a special thank you for everybody who's um, taught me a lot of things here, including prayer warriors. Some of the people here taught me how to pray, and you know who you are. So this morning, I just want to let you know that two things. This church is about those that are far from God. And by the way, I love the fact that I don't know a large percentage of you out here. Because at one point, I almost knew everybody. But this church's is, is heart is after people who are far from God. Maybe they don't even know who God is. Maybe they did, but they kind of left him for many reasons. Maybe, you know, there's so many reasons why people sometimes grow up in their faith, and maybe that old church, maybe that old pastor, somebody offended you, but this church is for those who are far from God. But this church is also about something we don't talk much about. This church is about making disciples. See, the Great Commission is about preaching the gospel, going to the ends of the earth to preach the gospel, but it's also about making disciples, and thank God for that, because that's why I'm here. They've been discipling me for years. I'm coming here for like almost 11 years. Um, so this morning, I want to take you guys on a little tour of what's happening in Guatemala. I'm super excited about there. I'm actually happy to call Guatemala my home now, believe it or not. Um, so let's show you a couple slides. I'm going to show you a first one. The first one is our, is our building in Guatemala that we um, launched. We launched that about seven days before we came back to America and COVID-19 hit. We did an awesome service. About 26 people served that day. We're in Waters Church shirts. Um, we had people in the parking lot waving to people. We had greeters. We had ushers. We had the band. We had everything gone. Security, you know. And um, we, all, we launched a great service. I'll show you the interior. The interior, we, put, we did what we do here. We put all the lights up. We wanted to make it attractive. We wanted to bring the people in. And, you know, that day, we actually did more electricity in the church that day than the whole entire village combined with every single home. That's how we praise God and Waters Church. Amen? It was so exciting when I got back here to America, by the way, and I opened up that door and I heard the music in here and I just felt that spirit of God. Thank God for the worship here because our Father deserves worship. Amen? Um, I want to show you another picture now. This is the Waters Church now. A flood came through and devastated that campus. So that campus had 400 missionaries coming in there a week, making approximately $1,000 a person. Calculate that by four times a month, and their income stopped. That, no one's come and visited them since COVID started in March 1st. We were the last uh, missionary group to actually go to Hope of Life. Then all of a sudden in the fall, the, the river explodes and after 27 years and it wiped out so much, but the water level went right up to that window, but it did not go inside that church. And God preserved that building. And right now, um, in order for us to get it going again, well actually we're taking the villages around it, we're just leveling everything and we gotta go run fresh electrical lines and we gotta do so much there. And I went down to the campus and I, I prayed and I talked to God and I said, Lord, you know, why did you let all that happen? We spent so much money in the place. We launched it. It was successful. And now, you know, look what happened. And he gave me a Bible verse. And the, uh, it was from the book of Haggai. And God said, my former house, my former house will not be as good as my new house. And I was like, wow. God gave me a vision that the new things he's going to do in Guatemala is going to blow that building out. But at that time, that was like our hopes and dreams. I was going there to open that building. Let me show you the vision what God actually gave me. Churches without, we talk about churches without walls. What do you think about that? Fields, people don't even need seats. They can come. What do we do at the Xfinity Center? We put down blankets, right? And we go to a concert. People can come and just sit on the grass and, li and listen to preaching. And I, we don't need air condition. You know, we're probably going to put a metal roof over it. But God gave me this spirit. We're going to stop putting churches out there and then not having walls. We're going to just stop putting them up, putting them up, putting them up small, big. Who knows what it's going to be? But God gave me this burden. So we're running with it. And to be honest with you, I'm on fire. I'm excited. Every day I wake up, I'm excited because there's like purposes involved. There's things happening. And right now, let me show you a quick picture of where we're currently doing service. This is a place on the campus of Hope of Life called Taiwan. Every little area of the campus has a name. 
Again, no walls. Uh, beautiful. And uh, we'll show you another picture. So this is just another side angle, and we'll go to another one. It's just beautiful. There's just palm trees, you know, and I have a huge band. I, I think my band right now is up to almost like 18 people, but the dynamics are so unique. I've taken everything that this church has taught me. I went out there with one thing in mind, but I know my Bible, and I know my scriptures, and I knew what I was here to bring good news and good news is good news. It doesn't need anything but a mouth to tell the good news. And um, we have our media teams. We have security. We have the band. You know what's funny about my band members is I couldn't hire people that were volunt that wanted to come to Waters Church, you know, and, and they could play my music. I had to make up a band. My band right now, almost all of them are the children of pastors, believe it or not. And they actually, when they're done worshiping at my church, they actually go to other churches and continue to worship. Some of them will go to Guatemala City three hours away and worship out there and put in 14-hour days. But every week, we seem to have like new faces for our worship team. This is just what God's put together. What is the church? The church is the body, right? The church is the body of Jesus Christ. It's not even just made up of you, but we love you, and I'm proud to be a campus pastor of this specific church, you know? Um, one other picture here we'll show you. This is, uh, so this is my wife baptizing a girl right in the pool. It's her first baptism, amen? We were there for maybe three weeks. We gave an altar call. A girl raised her hand to receive Jesus Christ. And by the way, missionaries have told me, one of my friends told me to the best of his knowledge, that's the first hand that's gone up in two years because most of the churches out there only have like 12 people. Everyone comes. They're all Christians. They don't even do an altar call. I'm not saying all of them. I'm just saying many of them. But this little girl raised her hand, and um, the next week, I, I just went heavy, and I was like, listen, if you raise your hand to receive Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ has confessed me before men, and I'll confess you before my Father. You need to be baptized, you know? Stand on that promise that you just became a Christian. Show somebody that you're a Christian, you know? So she was the first one to get baptized. We'll show you another picture. This is a place called Oasis Eden, and praise God, Waters Church just launched its second location, second service, three days ago at this place right here. We had 34 people in attendance. It's an elderly place on campus. This little lady right here, when we did our service, um, I'm going to show you a video of her singing, maybe next time when I come in, unless you guys have it now. But next time I come in, this little lady asked if she could come forward and sing. Now, if some of you guys asked me right now if you can come forward and sing, we'd have to tell you no. So we have to vet your voice, you know? But I was like, yes, honey, come forward. And this lady, I can't sing, and she couldn't sing either. But she was just going like this. She was hunched over, and she was like, hallelujah. And that was her song. That's all she sang was hallelujah. Hallelujah. And it was so beautiful. Her friend right next to her came up and asked if she could sing a song. And before you know it, the little old ladies were coming up giving testimonies before all the other people. That campus, that portion of the campus has not seen Christians in 15 months. Missionaries, 400 a week were coming there, hugging them, drawing with them, having fun with them. And for 15 months, nobody's even seen them. And now they have a church service every single Wednesday at 3.30 p.m., we're going to be there and sing with the people. And you know, it was so funny. We're singing songs like When the Saints Go Marching In. We're singing songs like Oh, Be Careful, Little Eyes, What You See. Remember those? That's what they remember from the 60s and 70s. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. It was so awesome. And I got to tell you something. I'm excited about there. I can't wait to go back. And um, today, I just want to go over a few things with you. I want to go over with you guys the secrets of Christianity. If I am out in Guatemala and I'm running with the torch and I don't have people behind me, what am I doing? I'm just delivering the gospel by myself. That's not what I'm called to do. I'm called to be a pastor and pastor a flock. So I decided to start doing um, a, a series from my church called The Secrets of Christianity. And what sparked this series is a place on campus called the Canadian House. I like to call it the House on the Hill. If you've ever been to Hope of Life, you've probably stayed at this place. It's actually a beautiful place, but I took a picture of it at nighttime, and I made that little thing up because many missionaries will tell you, if you stay here 
you know, like when you be, first become a missionary, if you can stay here like for a month or two before you relocate to your house, which is what we do, they're like, you'll be fine anywhere in Guatemala. This place was bad. This place, I'll back up a little bit. My wife is, says to me, okay, honey, I'm coming out. I went out a month early to prep and get things ready. On the second floor of, of that house was a big porch area. All I get to stay in was a little room because each missionary stays in a room. But I put out two hammocks. I put out some trees and I put out some candles and I put out some lights and I just made it comfortable because we're transitioning into our home. And I was so happy to see my wife and um, she's like flying out. She gets there. The place looks beautiful. I got like $200 worth of big plants and I just made the upper level nice because I was there for like almost two months. She goes to bed happy. She wakes up sad. Why? Well, she's in a country, and all of a sudden, we start losing electricity. We start losing air condition. No water. Think about that. You wake up, can't flush toilets, can't clean anything. Go to take a shower. The shower's freezing. My wife, even if the shower's hot, thinks it's cold, but it's freezing. What you do is you like put a leg in, and you kind of like wash up outside the shower, and you put another leg in. She, the, the, the water's brown, can't drink it. We, we didn't understand all this, but it starts to happen. Like when you're a missionary, you're flying, you're in for a week, you're back in America. You become a missionary, you're there. All of a sudden, um, she goes to do laundry. How many women here like your clothes clean? Water's brown. I mean, it started going bad real quick. What do you think the answers that I gave her were? What does a pastor say to his wife, you know, I'm the pastor. She's not a pastor. She's my wife. God has called me to the field to preach, teach, you know, do all these things. She, she's called to come with me. You see, in life, people need real answers. And I love this about this church. I got real answers here. And um, what Christ has taught us is that we are the light of the world. We should have solutions. I wanted to run, but I can't leave wife behind. So I had to create secrets to teach her, and I had to come up with real answers for her. I couldn't tell her like the Apostle Paul says, you know, in whatsoever state I am, I've learned to be content. That's not gonna fly. She has to get ready in the morning. She needs to put her makeup, and she needs lights, and she, you know. Um, a men, we're easy. We'll jump in a hammock, go to sleep. There's a bug, we kill it. And by the way, the very first day we moved into our house, uh, the very first day, we're in the bathroom, and a scorpion came right through the wall, and she killed it because I didn't want to, and she's actually been killing all the bugs. Um, but I want to fly through a bunch of things with you today. I don't have much time because I shared a lot of slides with you, but I don't want to leave you without sharing some secrets. I'm going to talk fast, and I'd love for you to calculate what I'm saying to you because I'm really giving you some of my best secrets, and I'm going to do it in about 20 minutes. There's secrets, good secrets, bad secrets, there's sports secrets, there's cooking secrets, there's secrets all over the place. I love secrets, by the way. I'm someone who studies secrets and answers. You know, I love to study. But today I wanna go, with, I wanna teach you some of Christianity's secrets. And by the way, I'm gonna teach you a quick relationship secret. This is a good one, by the way. I've been using this for a while. When I talk to my wife, I speak to her when she's in a bad mood, by the way. And that's usually only if she's hungry. But I talk to her like she's a child, and I want to show you a picture up here. I have this picture of her in my Bible. When she's in a bad mood, I don't take it personal. I look at her like she's still in kindergarten. It's a really good secret, by the way. I learned this. And if you notice something in the Bible, Jesus always called his disciples children. He's doing the same thing. When my wife has no water and no, can't flush, and there's no protein and, and all these problems that she had, I don't look at her as a child at that point. I look at her as I'm her husband, I'm a head of the family, I'm gonna go fight for my wife, it's different. But I'm, that was just a little secret as we're talking about secrets in relationships. Sometimes, you know, your spouse, your significant other's in a bad mood, they're usually over in a couple hours, but that was one secret. But I want, in Christianity, I found 13 secrets. I'm gonna do a series on all 13 of these for my church. If pastor allows me to come back, I'll continue these with you. But genuinely knowing God is the very first secret that I learned. Some of you, if I ask you personal questions, what does God love, could you answer me? And I mean, what does he honestly love? Could you talk to me for an hour about it? I can talk to you for hours about it. What does God hate? And don't just say sin. What does he really hate, you know? 
Meditation. Don't just always talk to God. Ask him a question and be quiet. It's one of the biggest secrets of Christianity. It started in Genesis, I think, chapter 24. I think it was Isaac or Jacob was in the field meditating. Prayer. That's a, a huge secret. Fasting, study, simplicity, great secret. Don't think so high of yourself, by the way. <laughs> this is some of the secrets that I've learned. I was so prideful before I um, started serving in Waters Church, and I had to learn to be humble. I thought of myself so big. Um, you're not big. Keep things simple. Submission, service, confession, worship. A few weeks ago, I called my church forward. who was only like 25 people. I said, hey guys, come on forward for a second. I had them all stand in a circle. Remember, I'm in Guatemala, this is different culture. And I had them all close their eyes and I had them, I said, close your eyes, just try this. We're gonna sing a song. Try to just close your eyes and sing that song. And if you can, put your hands up, you know? Try to put them a little higher, just try it with me here. I'm, I'm, I'm leading my flock. There's secrets in worship. I kind of peeked and nobody had their eyes up. Two weeks ago, I walked around the church to take some photos. Tons of hands were up while the worship was taking place. My church is learning. They're learning some of my secrets. Guidance is a big secret. Celebration is a huge secret in the Bible. But before we get um, started, I just want to have you all stand real quick. Let's read a quick passage. From Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Jesus and his disciples were on their way. And he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. Many of you have heard this, by the way. But I'm teaching you something different here. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by herself, by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord said, you're worried and upset about many things, but... Few things are needed, or indeed, only one. And Mary has chosen what is better and will not be taken away from her. Lord, I stand on this stage right now in front of your people. And Father, I bring them to your feet. Lord, I ask you to quiet our minds and speak to us right now as we sit at the feet of Jesus and learn some secrets from his voice, in his word, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Today, I just want to go over with you one of those secrets. It's called the secret of study. Study is a discipline, by the way. I love to study. Something I just like to do is study. I'm a CEO for 27 years. I study, study, study. I just like it, and I always learn. One time, I played the game Connect Four. It's an elementary game. It's a little blue board with a bunch of chips, and you know, you got to connect the four things. I read a 160-page college thesis on how to never lose in Connect Four from an English professor, and now I can play any computer on the hardest level, and I can pick where I'm gonna beat it at the very beginning of the game. I will beat it in the fifth row in the sixth dot, period. You cannot stop what I'm gonna do to you. If you know my same algorithm, it will always be a tie, unless we make a human error. I like to study. And today, I could have taught you guys tons of stuff, but I wanted to just teach a study. And I'm gonna to have to cruise through this because I can't go into this massive seminar with you. But listen really closely here. Spiritual transformation is replacing old destructive habits with new life-changing ones. If you wanna change your pattern in life, you're gonna to have to study, study what? Study to take your destructive habits, you can't play a game, whatever it is, and learn to change them through study. One of the, um, actually I want to tell you something real quick here. One of the secrets with me being able to change was my mother came to me one day and asked me, do you need prayer for something? And I said, you know, I normally don't say this, but I said, yes, I do. I need prayer for bondage. I'm wrapped in a lot of bondage. I'm wrapped in a lot of sin. And I can't like, like break these habits. They were habits. They were habits I did for 20 years. People I hung out with, things I did. And she gave me a book and the book was very big. At the end of it, the secret to me changing my life, according to the author, was take the lies that you've believed your whole life one by one and replace it with truth. You have four walls in your brain, it's full of lies. Take the lies one at a time. I, 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 had, I weighed a lot earlier in my life. 
And the problem was I'd go get a piece of steak because I loved it. It was happy. It made me happy. And I'm eating it, but that doesn't make me happy. What makes me happy is eat a proper portion of steak, maintain some body weight so I can feel good and exercise and go back and eat the steak again. But I would eat a huge piece of steak, you know? See, the Apostle Paul teaches in Romans 12, chapter 2. He says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And one of the things about studying is studying brings transformation. Paul's secret to transform your mind is found in Timothy 2.15. Study to show yourself approved unto God. Point number one, life change happens when you study how to change your life. Some of you maybe don't care. My thing for you is I'm on fire. I want to see you on fire. We all have different messages. I'm a missionary in Guatemala on the move, so when I come here, I'm gonna to try to get some fire in you, you know, so you can see what's happening. I'm, you sent me here. You pay for me to be out there. Life change happens when you study how to change your life. I'm gonna show you a picture of me in 1992. That's what happens when you study how to change your life. At that time in my life, I always had a nine millimeter in my pants every day of the week, carried guns. I don't wanna tell you all my sins, but when the Apostle Paul says he was the chiefest of sinners, I could go to a debate team in Harvard and probably say, Brandon Braddock kind of beat you because I can put the list and it's massive. God changed my life. And one of my secrets, it's only one by the way, and it was the secret of study. I had to figure it out. What is wrong? And I, there's many reasons, but we're just, we're born in this society that teaches us lies all the time. I had to challenge questions. I had to challenge truth, you know? I had to pick one sin at a time and study it. How can I change this? Well, you know, a wise man attains on a wise counsel. And one at a time, I found these truths in Scripture. But let's relook at Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Jesus goes to a village. Martha opens up her home. Mary sits at his feet. Martha preps food. Prepping food was good. I'm a chef. If Jesus came to my house, I want to cook him my best food. Martha invites him in and cooks some food. Mary sits at his feet. How does life change happen? Point number two. Life change happens when you sit at the feet of the life changer. The very first thing I did when I became a missionary and went to Hope of Life, I was in the unknown. I didn't have a church. My church was full of rocks and water. I found a quiet place, and I, I put some a rug, I put some candles, I put three Asian lights, I put some plants, I put a speaker, and I meditated up there in quietness. I found a quiet place. I had to get to the feet of Jesus. See, me, I love reading his word. I love listening to his voice. When I have a problem, I gotta get to his words again, and that boom, there it is. My burden is easy, my yoke is light. Don't turn my burden into something heavy. Becoming a missionary in a third world country where there's no water and electricity, and the water's brown, and, and on and on and on. His burden's easy. Believe it or not, and, and, and I came up with solutions, and I'm going to tell you what they are in two minutes. But let's look again. Life change happens when you realize it's not about the Great Commission. It's about the Great Creator. Thank God I learned that, by the way. It's not about me going to the mission field. Yes, go to all the world and preach the gospel. How many preachers out there right now have dead churches? It's about the Great Creator. And I keep my eyes on him, and he keeps me full, and he keeps me fueled, and he gives me joy, and, and I can move. And when I have problems, I run to him, and I get real answers, by the way, from his word. In Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 24, he says, If any man glories, let him glory in this, that he understands and knows me. Because I understand my God, I know my God, and I follow my God, my life is so much easier. And I can go to Guatemala with a purpose, on the back of your paperwork, by the way, that your notes, um, it talks about the homework, the secret of study. I can't go into that with you right now, but if you're interested in what I'm talking about, read it. There's really good stuff in there. We live in one of the most educational portions of the world, the most educational states, and many of you, I don't think, really know how to study. Reflect on that tonight or, or take a look at it. Um, towards the bottom, it says, our problem is that we evaluate the experience without even studying it. We say Christianity is boring, Christianity is dumb, Christianity is for weak people. You prejudge Christianity, you haven't even studied Christianity because I have not found one single fault in my father's words, in his guidelines, in his protection, in his promises. Evaluation is done at the end. When we study, what we study actually determines your formed habit. And I wanna show a picture of my wife's Bible up on the screen. 
my wife told me that she can't read the Bible because it's just too hard and she, she has a problem reading and retaining. I taught my wife how to study. Color your Bible. Different things mean different things. And before you know it, she's already gone through the whole Bible and it looks like that, by the way, every single page because we taught her a pattern of study. Um, repeat, create um, time and reflect and observe. Reflect yourself, reflect what you read on others. And we, I teach her these secrets and now she loves to read the Bible because it, she has this, when you're creating a pattern, by the way, in your brain, it teaches significance. So guess what? She has her cup of coffee, she opens up her Bible, she brings her markers with her. There's a pattern happening. Well, her habits are now changing. This is what I'd love to see with you guys too. Study, if you open up that book, many of you, if I looked at your Bible, there's not a single mark in it. I know how much you read it. Um, in my Bible, you could turn to that one real quick. Um, mine, I actually put lots of codes. P for promise, DC for direct command. I have all these different codes, so when I get there, I feel like that movie, I think it was called A Beautiful Mind, when he opened up his shed, there was algebra written everywhere. That's how I am when I read the Bible. And the guy went to the village. I circled the village. Where is that village? It's just north of Israel. And, and, I, I, and I'm writing and stuff. I'm studying. Without going into too, too much details, in my Bible, I claim things. I claim things on the side. I, I write people's names if I'm praying for them or something, a prayer request. I'll actually date it. And when it comes true, I'll date it. And I put promises over my children in there. And I do so many things when I'm actually studying. Life change happens when you don't just study to live in freedom, but you study to live in his freedom. And I want to take you into Psalms 119 real quick. Psalms 119.15 says, I study your instructions. King David said that. Psalms 119.61 says, I stand in awe of your word. He studied, then he stood in awe of it. Psalms 119.1, blessed are those who walk in the law. He studied, he stood in awe of it, then he starts walking. Psalms 119.32, I will run in the ways of your commandments after you enlarge my heart. He studied, he stood in awe, he walked, and then he ran after what? After God enlarged his heart. Psalms 119.45, I will live in freedom. That's the goal, just so you know. The martial artist, like Bruce Lee, when he did Silam Da, which means simple thought, He broke free from it. The limo driver follows a GPS. He knows the streets, he breaks free from it. The chef measures his salt, measures his pepper. He breaks free from it, he just throws whatever he wants, he knows. And guys, I'd love to see you just break free in Christianity. It takes a lot of study. And you should love to study, sit at his feet. Um, my wife said before she came to Guatemala, she said, I'm, I'm really struggling and I had to ask Jesus, why are you allowing me to go through all this? She was in America at the time. A lot of struggling, by the way, that, that took place. And she said to me at one time, I, I don't hear God's voice. But you know what she said to me this time? She said to me, he said to me, you're struggling because I want to teach you that you don't need your husband. I hope I don't die because <laughs> he taught her that principle. But he spoke to her. She heard that voice and it said, you don't need him. I want you to trust in me. This is what I want you guys to get. Break free in Christianity. Stop judging others. And you ready for this? Stop judging yourself. The Apostle Paul said, I don't even judge myself. When you can do that, you can break free. And finally, my last point, the life change happens when you receive the life changer. You can do all the studying you want. You can sit at Christ's feet all you want. You can come to Waters Church every Sunday. But until you receive... Let it in, the life changer, you won't be free. Jesus said in John 8, 36, therefore when the sun sets you free, you will be free. My, first, my wife's first three days in Guatemala, no water to flush, no water to drink, no internet, brown water, no electricity, no AC, no food. She's lactose free, by the way, vegan free and gluten free in a country that does not provide those products. You know what my wife was thinking? This is my new life. You know what we did? I didn't give her shallow answers. I didn't tell her we're gonna trust in the Lord. I claimed God's promises over her. Ecclesiastes 5.3 says, I made a, oh, it says our dream is made in the multitude of business. 
I'm a businessman. When I read that verse, I was like, yeah, everybody has a dream. A, a dream without a plan is only a wish. I knew this thought process. And I said, I made a business plan. I claimed Ecclesiastes 5.3. How did I know that? Because my Bible had the letter P in the book of Ecclesiastes. I became a gatekeeper of my time. I claimed Ecclesiastes 11.4. He who watches the wind will never plant. I said, I'm not waiting for nothing. I'm going to be proactive. I fought for my wife. I fought for my family. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 14 he talks about this. He says, men, fight for your children. Um, I knew my identity. I'm a pastor. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. If a man can't run his own house, how can he run the house of God? How can I open up churches and do all this if I don't have water and electricity and AC? You know what I started to do? I went and bought a water tank. It's this big. And the water pressure was too low. I bought a water pump. And the water was freezing in the shower. I bought a water heater. And you know, the, the problems that I had were so much. I ended up hiring my own plumber, just so you know. He works for me full time. He's a construction guy and a plumber. He's on call 48 hours a week, on my clock, by the way. Um, we didn't have any drinking water. I bought five gallon jugs of water. We didn't have any food. We traveled to Guatemala to get it. Proverbs chapter 31 says a virtuous woman travels afar for her food. We claim God's promises. We didn't sit there and go, you know, Jesus is just um, trusting the Lord. No, we action. The Bible says, um, seeking you shall find. And I just wanted to share those secrets with you. This is no joke, but I didn't want to live on campus. I wanted to live off campus. It's not too safe out there. My wife wasn't 100% safe. I paid security guard to, last night, the next three nights, sit at my front door from 11 p.m. till 5 in the morning. We're Christians. We're the light of the world. We have the solutions. We have the answers. We don't sit back. My God said, you know, um, have dominion over this earth. This is his plan. I'm the light of the world, and I want to take this, you know, what you guys have given me, and I want to run with that torch. Why? Because I studied his word. I was sick of living my old life, just full of lies. I wanted freedom. I wanted purpose. I wanted to be free. And I'll tell you something else. I'm on fire, and it's your fault. <laughs> it's your fault. You sent me out there. And I want you guys to be on fire. I don't, when I, whenever I see a Christian that's weak, I'm like, ugh. But I have to remind myself, he doesn't know what you know. You got to walk with him. You got to teach him. I got to take him right to the word. I got to teach him. You got to stand in awe of these words. If you don't stand in awe of these words, you're missing out on God's blessings. When I sin, there's another promise for that one. I claim all of God's covenants. A just man falls, he gets back up. I claim, I'm telling you, I claim promises for everything. If you ever saw my Bible, you'd blow your mind. My sermon in a sentence is when the life giver gets a hold of your heart. The life savior helps you take your life trials like we experienced. And he turns them into life freedom through the study of his life promises. Every head bowed. The Bible says the secrets of the Lord are with the righteous, and I'm going to show them my covenants. There's a covenant for that. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. Life change happens when you study how to change your life, yes. When you sit at the feet of the life changer, yes. But Martha was there too. Your real life happens when you receive the life changer.